Usually people like to identify me by my professional title, Dr. Latrice Atkins, and I immediately shut them down. Hello and welcome to Obehi Podcast. I'm your host, Obehi Ewan Fox, and I strongly believe that everyone has a story to share. Now let's get started with this episode. My first name is Latrice. I've spent the majority of my career teaching at the higher education level, hence the doctor. But I don't need the title in order to relate to others. And so people just call me Latrice. Or if I can't convince them to do that, at least they'll call me Dr. Latrice. That's beautiful, Latrice. Let's start it like this. Uh, Because we are going to be talking about history today, because I, I love history because it tells us where we are coming from and also it gives us the context of even where we are right now. So uh, give me a little background of you growing up. Where were you born? Tell us something. Okay, my personal history begins in a community that we call Sunny South Dallas. Dallas is a huge, sprawling uh, metroplex, but I spent the bulk of my formative years in a neighborhood called South Dallas, which literally just means south of downtown Dallas. Um, It was working class, working poor when I was growing up. And now it's more uh, lower class, lots of issues like homelessness, uh, rapid uh, drug addiction and that sort of thing. But my childhood was very insulated with love on all sides, love from my local Baptist church, love from the public school system and a very loving. Uh, matriarchal matriarchal home, meaning that our home was centered around female figure as opposed to male figure. My mom, my grandma, uh, and my aunt grew up so close with my first cousins that they're basically like sisters and brothers. Grew up so closely with the kids at my church that we're still in contact and our kids know, you know, their kids. And so just um, to use an anecdote, I grew up on a bed of love. I I grew up being loved and affirmed as a little black girl. I never thought there was anything that I couldn't do that I set my mind to. Never thought there was any dream that I couldn't have. And so I went through school with a 4.0, basically graduated valedictorian with a 4.0, got an academic scholarship to Wellesley, uh, the world's premier women's uh, college, and met all kinds of women there, uh, competed uh, with them. Uh, and then eventually finished a master's and a doctorate in history from Michigan State. So very smart, nerdy kind of girl, Christian uh, background. But I think at the core uh, of who I am as a human is love. And I've learned uh, how to love people who are a lot like me and love people who are very different than I am because that foundation is there in just love. And if there's a human right I believe in, I believe in the human right that we're all entitled to unconditional love. So that kind of sums who I am. That's powerful, Latrice. That's powerful. Love is the biggest thing in the world. It's a, it's a kind of, uh, it's a rope that ties us together as a humanity, as, a, as one family. It is powerful. I, I love that. I love that. And I hope it should dominate the experience that we're going to be talking about today, looking at history. Because history is another important aspect of our life because it tells us where we are coming from. Um, now, my question, my curiosity actually is, how did you get into history? When I first began trying to think about my life as an adult, and I think a lot of kids started out this way, maybe by middle school, people start asking, what do you want to be when you grow up, right? And so I started out wanting to be a scientist. I love processes. I loved discovery. I love making things dirty and messy and then trying to figure out what was going to happen next. My mom even bought me an uh, expensive chemistry set that we couldn't afford, obviously, because we were a single uh, parent household. But she made that investment and sacrifice. I also explored music. I played the flute for several years, about six or seven years within the marching band. I played the piano. And so if there is such a thing as a Renaissance woman, I was that. I love science. I love music. I love the arts. 
I did junior theater. I did all of these things. And I make a joke, uh, Obehi, that one of the challenges of being someone who does a lot of things well is that it's really, really difficult sometimes to find your passion, to find that thing that you were sent on the earth to do, to find your purpose, because you do so many things well. And I had that problem of doing so many things well. And so by the time I got to high school and my teachers were seeing all of these skills and all of these talents, I was pulled in all these directions, president of the student government, uh, president of uh, Future Teachers of America, just all of this stuff. And at some point I did feel a little overwhelmed because I couldn't answer the question, what do you want to be when you grow up in a single sentence? Because I was involved in so many activities. By the time I got to Wellesley, that feeling of being overwhelmed got to the point that I actually uh, sought out our counselor on campus was like, I don't even know how to pick a major. I feel so disempowered, everything coming at me and all of these possibilities and working with a professional therapist I really began to figure out what it is that I most enjoy. All my life, people told me, you would be a wonderful judge. You probably should go to the Supreme Court. You're very level-headed, very fair-minded, can take a lot of information and really see what needs to be done. And, and, and you speak so well, you definitely should be an attorney. And so I started taking pre-law at Wellesley and was most miserable. I didn't enjoy the classes. I didn't enjoy the reading. And I figured that if I was miserable in pre-law, how much more miserable would I be if I became an attorney? So that wasn't it. So I was in crisis. And the courses that I found the most relatable, the courses that brought me um, the most comfort in terms of quieting uh, that sense of being lost and overwhelmed were courses about our shared history. I'm presuming that you're also a person of African descent and, and learning about who we are uh, from the continent through the diaspora and all of the languages and all of the religions and all the different foods and just all the different ways that we uh, were acculturated uh, and then some of the ways where we were assimilated and then some of the ways where we were just completely resistant and we're going to stay very African no matter where we were or what language we spoke or what God they told us to serve fascinated me. And it is those stories of survival and resilience with regards to who we are as an African people that really captivated my heart. And then I spent the next 14 years studying those things. That's lovely. Who we are. I like that. Now, there are some people who do not understand the tricacies of the African-American history. They don't understand what, what has happened, what is happening. They don't understand it. Now, as a historian, how would you, what would you want somebody to know about African Americans? Okay. I, I would share at least three what we call theories about identity formation, how the group of people who identify as African American, and we're extremely diverse. I don't want to create a monolith like we're all alike because Black Southerners are not the same as Black Detroiters. Uh, but how we came to be. So I'll share three quick theories. Uh, R. Martin Delaney, R. Martin Delaney in the 19th century, he said that people of African descent who live in America are a nation within a nation. We're very African in the sense of our origin, but we're very American in the sense of our lived experience. But we're not fully American because of institutional racism, because of how the country evolved after defeating um, New, uh, England in um, the American Revolution. We held on to slavery. We made concessions for slavery. We didn't outlaw slavery outright. And we continue to make those concessions until the defeat of the South of the Civil War. And because of that, our Martin Delaney argues, we are a nation within a nation. W.E.B. Du Bois then came back and said, you know what, quite honestly, because of this phenomenon of having to exist as a people that is separate, unique, and distinct, but in a symbiotic relationship, meaning that we have some things in common that allow us to survive as Black Americans and that allow the country to grow even as they uh, feed off of us in certain kinds of ways, 
uh, W. E. B. Du Bois called that double consciousness. That at all times, people of African descent in the United States are conscious of the fact that we are different and not like the majority, but we definitely are no less American. So R. Martin Delaney says we're a nation within a nation. W. E. B. Du Bois says we have a dual or a double consciousness. And then uh, as we get out, get closer to where we are today in terms of the 21st century, we have all kinds of different movements that are attempting to define who we are. One of the most um, controversial is the Black Lives Matters movement, uh, kind of coming off of um, the murder of African people at the hands of people who are supposed to protect all life and all citizens, uh, a group of young people, millennials, were saying, no, we've got to make sure that people understand that our lives matter and are just as vulnerable and just as fragile as anyone else's life. And we need people to respect our humanity, right? And so understanding and wrapping your mind around the Black experience really does invoke all of these different ways of trying to explain how we've experienced life in the United States of America, from being a nation within a nation to functioning as a human with a double conscious, to really realizing that there are targeted attacks on our humanity because of our lived experiences and unequivocally declaring, no, we are fully American, we are fully human, and we're entitled to all the rights, including protection, that all others are. And so understanding who we are as a people really does call for a historical uh, lens so that you can see these different identity formation theories and forces over time. Thank you so much for that. That's very important. In fact, there is a lot uh, that is in there, and we're going to be unpacking it uh, of course, I'm not full following it chronologically. I just want to pick the one that strike me <laughs> the more. <laughs> so uh, after the killing of uh, George Floyd, there was this uh, young millennial, like you put it. Of course, really, they are young millennial. I remember, for example, the one that started the movement in the United Kingdom was almost 18. You know? So uh, this is very important. It's very important to point out that this, there is this generational shift in the mentality in our understanding of history of yeah. who we are and also on how we react to the situation in front of us so i believe i always say in in, in the case of modern africa for example that why today uh, many africa many of us are still comfortable uh putting our head low as they say sad, sad to the oppressor a generation of africans are coming they are not going to do that. They are going to ask for what is there without minding what is the consequences. And they are the ones that are going to save Africa from what it is. Not many of us who are too scared to be, to be shot at. Because, anyway, let me leave it there. Now, there was this message that needed to be proved to the people that black lives also matter. That is, that is the message. It's a very simple one. No? It doesn't mean that other life doesn't matter anymore. But it just means that black people's life equally matter. Of course, you cannot put all this one in the, um, in the banner. No? It would be too long. So it simply was black life matter. Anyway, what I'm taking out from there is that this message needed to be understood. All right. This is 2022. Do you think that message was understood? I, I believe so. One of the things that helped me kind of wrap my mind around the Black Lives Matter Matters movement as a person who is Generation X, I'm over 50, so I'm younger than a baby boomer, but far too old for the compliment of um, being a millennial. But the way I kind of wrap my mind around how they owned their own identity formation and their role in history. I kind of took it back to Greensboro, North Carolina, and those college students uh, from North Carolina A&T who sat at that counter and said, actually, we're not going to go through the back door today. We're not going to do it to go today because the prices we pay for our food are the same prices that all the other customers pay. We're going to opt to sit at this corner, at this counter today. And they were met with violence and they were met with resistance and they left there wearing their food uh, that they had paid for because other people were not ready 
um, for them to sit at that counter. And that's how it makes sense of the Black Lives Matter movement, that there are even some Black people who are not ready uh, to, to hear the affirmative, unapologetic assertion that Black Lives Matter. And I'm proud of the young people um, and their responses. Although you may not be ready for us to make that stance and push identity formation that way and push uh, social justice in this direction and push uh, racial justice in this direction and push equity in this direction, you guys might not be ready, but we've got to move. And sometimes, oh baby, you, you, you have to accept that, that when the generation comes into its own, that there may be some who are not ready uh, to push in that direction, but they still got to, and this is an expression I believe the young people use, they still have to walk in their truth. And so I'm proud of them for walking in their truth, even though I don't fully understand everything about how they process and move forward, um, but they have every right, every historical right to contribute to this historical narrative and put their stamp on it, just as assuredly as those North Carolina A&T students did when they sat at that counter. Um, to push um, freedom in the direction that it needed to go. So I'm really proud of them. I really am. And, and, and I don't have to fully understand. I don't have to fully agree. But what I can do is recognize their right uh, to press in that direction and their historical need uh, for them to do so. And I think, I think it had an impact because I'm watching it reverberate uh, around, the, around the globe and people getting it, who didn't get it before. There were people who were touched uh, when the Black Lives Matter movement took up the banner of that injustice, that murder that happened in broad daylight. Um, and, they, and they finally got it and they started taking to the street. They started writing checks because nothing else had really clicked for them before. And they said, we can't have human beings be forming and behaving in this way. It's not acceptable. People in Britain said it was not acceptable. People in France said this is not acceptable. So it's not an issue of the ongoing tension between Black and white Americans, which probably will never go away. That's not it. It was bigger than that. It's We have an expectation of how humans treat other humans. And it's a baseline. And murdering people in the street is unacceptable. And I think that that message hit home. All right. I will be happy if the message got home. And most important, I will be more happy if the people take action on that correctly in a way that, at least in the United States, that can be, it can be a peaceful society where people can be walking on their street and they say, okay, yes, in this place, I am safe. After all, that is your country. You should be safe at home. I think it's right. difficult for yeah, yeah. the United States to appreciate um, some things that other countries um, have ensured because we, we struggle and, and trip over two things, Obehi. We trip over capitalist profit and what makes money. We, we trip over that. We, we get entangled in that. And then we, we trip up over... Um, fear. And give me a moment. I want to give you an example of both. So Let's go ahead. There are some societies that are a lot more peaceful uh, than ours. And instead of investigating how peace and safety is working there, we will hold to how we've done things and continually assert that the way we, we do them um, are, you know, constitutional. Case in point, the Second Amendment about the right to bear arms. Taking out of historical context, people are taking that to mean that any adult uh, should be able to purchase a gun and have a virtual arsenal at their house if that's what they want. And that is not actually the context in which that amendment was made. It was made because we were in a situation where people's homes were being invaded and people's privacy was being destroyed and they had no recourse. They didn't have an opportunity pr to protect themselves. Um, that the militia had more power uh, over a community than the men and women in that community. And so we, we take a right 
to its illogical extreme sometimes. And we forget that our real job is to make sure that everyone does feel safe and that everyone is protected. And so when we make the right higher than the human value of safety and protection, you get 18 year olds who are legally able to go get a gun and then shoot up and murder children, right? The other issue is fear. When people have made fear their bedfellow, when people have made fear their friend, then they're unable to think outside the box other scenarios and other possibilities that would bring health and safety and protection to all because they are so afraid. So if you teach people to be afraid of Black people, if you teach people to be afraid of people with mental illness, if you teach people to be afraid of poor people, if you teach people to be afraid of people who have uh, sexual and gender uh, identities that are different than the mainstream, if people are afraid, then it becomes incredibly difficult for people to use our God-given imagination and begin to construct different options and possibilities for how we can make sure that we are as inclusive as possible and that everyone feels safe, everyone feels protected, everyone feels valued. You're not able to do that if you are hung up on the profit in something or if you are entangled and ensnared in fear. You have to be pretty dang fearless in order to make a commitment to human rights, to equity, to fairness, to freedom. You can't be afraid of anything if you really believe in those things. And unfortunately, my country is still ensnared in a lot of fear. Thank you for that. That is a powerful remark. The fear. Um, do you think that fear is being manipulated? Actually, that the fear is an instrument that is being used to manipulate the people. Because at the end of the day, somebody is in charge. Somebody is in charge of the narration. And whether the outcome is what the person or this group of people want or not, they have the power to be able to make a decision based on the outcome of this, this manipulation, if you want to put it like that. Because the fear that have not been sold into the mind of the people lead to something else. And, you know, sometimes you can say, okay, maybe that is not what they want. If that is not what they want, the narration should change. In any case, what I'm trying to ask you is, is are the people being manipulated through fear or are they just they yet do not understand that they need to be able to overcome this? No, I don't think that fear is being used to manipulate people. Uh, I've traveled internationally, Obehi, and one of the things that kind of hurts my feelings sometimes when I travel is that people love to say that Americans are dumb, that we're just dumb and we don't get things. And I'm like, no, we're far from dumb. And so, no, I don't think fear is being used to manipulate people. What I do think is happening, though, is that fear is monetized. So if I can get you to be afraid of Black people, to be afraid of poor people, to have this foreboding that you're going to be attacked in your home and they're going to steal your stuff and kill your dog and, and you just... And so I monetize fear. So in order for you to feel safe, then you need to buy, you know, the top of the line ADT product. And every time they make a new one, you run out and get it because you want to be able to monitor your house wherever you are because you don't want to... We need... To, to, to slow it down. There's nothing wrong with a home security. There's nothing wrong with, you know, having, you know, guns because you want to protect your family or even if you, you know, want to go hunting, whatever. But you need to make sure that your decisions are making sense and in line with what you truly value and believe. I think sometimes we kind of opt out of being deliberate in our decision making, but that's not because we're being manipulated by the gun industry. We're being manipulated by multimedia and they've got an agenda. No, no, no. Each individual who's a functioning adult needs to be deliberate about the decisions that they make. 
And when you figure out that something in your life has been monetized so that it can extract the greatest amount of profit for someone else, as opposed to what's the best and most beneficial for myself, for my community, for my children, you may need to slow your thinking processes down to ask some better questions and come up perhaps with some different options. There is no law against monetizing things in the United States. There is no law against commodifying it with a few exceptions. You can legally buy some sex in Las Vegas, I believe, but you can't legally buy some sex somewhere else. But just a few exceptions. You know, we will allow people to monetize and commodify things because that's our country and who our country is. And it's not their responsibility to figure out why you are spending money on meth, why you are spending money on crack, why you are spending money on cigarettes, why you are spending money on alcohol, why you are spending money on gun after gun after gun. That's not their job. It's my job to figure out my habits. It's your job to figure out your habits. And if you figure out that some person or a corporation is getting rich over some stuff in your life that you haven't dealt with, you need to deal with those things. And two things I'm telling you, and I'm saying it publicly, that we all need to look at is our fear factor. Are there things in our life that we are just so gripped with fear about that we'll spend a ton of money to avoid dealing with as opposed to really answering. And if we're smoking because of that, if we're drinking because of that, if we're shooting up because of that, or if we're stocking guns because of that, that's something we need to look at. And that's not the responsibility of any industry or group of people or stockholders. That's my job as a functioning adult. I'm sorry, I know you didn't call me to preach, but yeah. No, I, no, no, I, no, 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 you're, you're, you're welcome, we, we accept it. Responsibility, I don't like this conspiracy theory, they're trying to kill us all, da, da, da. no. We need to make better decisions. Mothers need to, fathers need to, legislatures need to, preachers need to, anybody that's a functioning adult needs to make better, more informed decisions. And don't pass the book. Don't allow um, theories to make decisions where you should be making decisions. And you should be okay if you make a decision that is contrary to how the trend is going, if you really made that decision out of conviction. Now, from the point of view of history, when you look at the past and the present, looking at the situation you see today, how do you feel? I, I feel very optimistic, but you have to know, and this is a disclaimer, I'm very Pollyanna. I'm half glass full. So I'm not a gloom and doom, fire and brimstone. Um, no, I, I'm very Pollyanna about it. I'll use this as an anecdote. I read that uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, who was one of the pillars of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, um, she traveled all over the South. She registered people to vote in Mississippi. Um, she was one of, um, if not the voice uh, for those freedom songs we now uh, sing. She would turn uh, Baptist gospel hymns into freedom songs and they would sing them on the bus and all this stuff. And one night she was arrested and they beat Fannie Lou Hamer in the head and could have killed her almost to the point of unconsciousness, beat this black woman and left her on a concrete floor in the Mississippi jail. And do you know that when she was interviewed about that, all she had to say is, is that if I have to go through that to make it better, this is a quote verbatim for some child. If I have to go through that to make it better for some child, I'm some child obey. I graduated from an Ivy League. I have a doctorate. People call me for my opinion. I am some child. And I know that we have not arrived. We have not. The life expectancy for Black people is drastically different uh, than white Americans. The incarceration rate, incarceration rate for Black men is, is abysmal. Uh, heart disease among Black women, abysmal. I'm not going to sit here and say, hey, I'm so happy we've arrived. We had a Black president. And I'm happy we had a Black president. I voted for him both times. But the election of uh, former President Barack Obama and his beautiful wife, Mrs. Michelle Obama, that wasn't the harbinger that, you know, all the problems of Black America uh, are over. But their ascension to that White House, become the first family, a family of color, does signal that some things 
have changed. And for that, I have some optimism. I also have optimism for the changes that I'll never see. Obey. There are some things I'll never get a chance to see because I'm not going to live to be 300. But if we support our young people, if we tell them that you have every right to voice what you believe your country should be and what you owe the country and what the country owes you, if we support them, then they're going to press for change. I'll give another anecdote. When I was at Wellesley, I, I went there at, at 18. I'm still a Christian. And I spoke out openly against homosexuality. I said that um, I don't approve of homosexuality, but I don't think that it's right to be unkind or cruel uh, to someone who is homosexual. And the women at Wellesley who identified as homosexual were crushed that I said that publicly. They felt that I had set the school back decades because they had worked so long to be able to be visible, to be seen, da da da, and hear this very outspoken, eloquent black Southern girl who's a Christian said she didn't approve. Now it's been thirty plus years since I graduated from Wellesley, and I sit on the board of a black trans women organization. So this organization was started by people who were born biologically male, but who identify as a woman, dress, talk, live, have children, have marriages. So there are women, as I am a woman, but a black trans woman. I'm on the board of directors. My sister um, identifies uh, as a lesbian, and I'm very proud. I'm always doing things that just show, I mean, I just, you would think that I'm a part of their community, wearing colors, cheering, you know, loving uh, the women that she's in love with, being, just being there, being present. What am I getting at? That at any given moment, when someone shows that they are bigoted or they are uh, short-sighted or that their definition of liberty or freedom or love is limited, there is still hope. There's still hope for them. I'm not the same. 30 years later, I enlarged my definition of love to embrace them. And so I think that it's important for people who are as old as I am and older, even though we may not get everything the millennials are doing, even though we may not agree with everything that they are doing, please, let's do remember, let's do remember that we've got to support, we've got to give them room. And over time, over time, if their thinking needs to adjust, it will, because we're all still growing. None of us are static. We're all still growing. But to shut them down and shut them out is a mistake. But to let them have their leadership moments and give them an opportunity to grow, even if I don't see the fruit of it myself. Thank you for that. You see, that is it. That is the power of love. It is powerful. It is. It is powerful. And talking of the millennium, talking of the younger generation, of course, we don't even have alternative. They are the only hope that we have. So we must allow them to live, to live and to live fully, to express themselves and to be able to judge this world according to how they understand it. Because that is the only way we can go forward. Otherwise, we are going to be going backward. I like how Thank you phrased it, to judge this world as they find it. They don't find it the way that I do because they're not living a 50 plus year old life looking at it right. And I love that to judge it the way that they find it, you know, and, and hopefully they can find the grace and mercy to still include us over 50 year olds, meaning that they also have to look at us uh, through that lens of love that perhaps my inability to, to take it that far is something that they can still love and affirm. Um, it's a, it's a two-way street, uh, I think. Um, well, they're giving some mercy and some grace, and I'm giving some mercy and the grace, but what we have in common is the love of all humanity, people of African descent being among them, not being exclusive, not being first. It's not a ranking. We're just simply saying we're, we're as human as everyone else, entitled to all the rights that all humans are. Similarly, people in the LGBTQIA plus community, human, human people entitled to all the rights that any humans are entitled to. And that we're linking arms and saying as we move forward into the 21st century, we want to get closer 
to a more perfect union, if I may use uh, lingo uh, from United States history. We want a more perfect union, and that more perfect union has to have equity in it and, and, and equity and inclusion. It has to, if it's going to be more perfect. All right. Now, looking at African America, looking at the larger diaspora community, and looking at history, because you're a historian, I want to believe that there are some people who yet do not even understand how to describe history. How do you describe history yourself? I'll describe it the way I was trained, and then I can perhaps break it down a little bit. So at Michigan State, um, we had a program ran by Dr. Darlene Cockhine, who's at Northeastern University now. And she taught us that history is a process. It's not a who, what, when, where. Those are the facts that journalists study, who, what, when, where. She taught us that history is the process. So history answers the question of how and why. And the process that we're looking at is how things have changed over time. So history is a process. It's not the facts of what, when, where, and who, no. History is a process of how things change over time. And the process is explained by asking how and why. So the minute you ask how this happened and why this happened, and you begin to explain it as a change over time, then that's when you're actually talking about history. And perhaps, Obehi, that's why I am optimistic, because I can look at change over time in the lived experience of being a Black person in the United States, and I can see some things have changed for the better. Not everything, but I can see some things have changed for the better. And there have been some challenges that have persisted, some challenges that are so entrenched in the culture, in the thinking of the country, um, that we have not been able to overturn them as of yet. But the ascension of the first black female Supreme Justice gives me hope. It gives me hope. It gives me hope. So if you want to understand history, you can't get stuck on the negative. You have to say, when I look at it over time, do I see change for the better? When I look at it over time and I see the things that are wrong, that are negative, that have persisted, do I see new thinking and new strategies to address it? I'm sorry to harp here, but I'm going to go here. This is why those young people are so important, Obehi, because if we're still seeing the same problems persistently, consistently, so entrenched that we have not been able to change them, Obehi, that suggests that the strategies that we've been using have not worked or else that should have been solved by now. So we do need fresh thinking, new people at the table to come up with some strategies and some ways of dealing with it that we haven't tried before. Because if we had done it correctly, that particular issue or challenge or problem would not still be with us. You are talking, you are, you are talking um, and also thinking like a, like a scientist. That is how the scientists work, no? Because yeah. if we already know everything, like, okay, in the religious feed, we already know everything. Everything is understood. It must be like this. When it gets to this, that is the end of it. Nothing more, nothing new. But the scientists don't think like that. Ah, okay, this is how you see it. Okay, fine. But let's try there is another way to see it. So in this world, in the world that we live in today, the 21st century, we must appreciate, we must, in fact, invite other points of view to how the team functions. In fact, this is one of the things I really love about the United States as a country, as a, as a kind of an experiment, I would usually say, you know, that they want to test everything. The scientists welcome all the point of view. Let's examine it. It's based on evidence. If after we have done everything, we have all succeed, that is where it ends for us now. Other people must continue with the same logic of try to find out. I love that. I love that very well. Now, looking at history, 
Looking at the possibility that younger people should and must participate in history and with their point of view also, with the way they see it, where do you think they should start from? There are two groups of young people. So we have the 18 to 35. So they are legally adult. Uh, and most of them are probably either still in school, just starting their career, starting their family, just buying a house. And so they have a lot of demand on their resources, a lot of demand on their time. So that's one group of young people. And then we have young people who are not legally fully adult. They're under 18. So we have these two groups of, of young people. So I'm going to address the former and uh, then the latter. So the young people who are under 18 years of age. It's encouraging to see that across the United States, there is a lot of choice in terms of edu educating your child. They can go to public school. They can go to charter school. Because of COVID, we had another option emerge, homeschooling like never before. It could be homeschooling that you're doing independently, homeschooling because the charter school allows homeschool or remote, homeschool because the school district uh, allows. So we have uh, those options. So we have a lot of options with regards to education. What I would love to see, regardless of what the option is, if the parent is in control of it, or if it's remote from a charter or a public school, or if it's on-site with charter, or if it's on-site uh, with public, is more attention to character development uh, and um, a social responsibility that's beyond just citizenship, and more so uh, about your 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 role in in being in the human family, that that would be really great, and it's it's idealistic of me, Obehi, because there are people who get upset uh, about um, trans youth, for example. They don't want boys, quote unquote, playing on girls' teams. They don't want boys going into the girls' bathroom, and they're so stuck. Uh, on how they view um, a young person who is transitioning from their biological assigned sex into their real identity of who they are, that they can't see uh, that that short-sightedness is not only harmful for that child and the development of that one human, but it's not healthy for, for the children overall to get that message of, of rejection uh, to uh, criminalize their parents' desire to show them unconditional love and support, even if it means going as far as consulting a doctor uh, about medications and surgery and, and those things of that nature. They, they don't see that. So that's what I would hope. And again, it's, it's a pipe dream and pie in the sky for character education that positions our children to realize they're a part of something called the human family, beyond being Black, beyond being American, you're part of the human family. And in the human family, we all need unconditional love, safety, protection from being tormented, traumatized, et cetera, and being positioned to evolve and grow into the most loving, productive human that we absolutely can, no matter what the other labels are male, female, rich, poor, black, white, American, Ukraine, no matter what the label is, humans. Humans need unconditional love, support, validation to become the most loving, productive human that they can be. And it would be wonderful if those babies from pre-K to 12 heard that all the time as they go from course to course, grade to grade, you're loved, you're validated, evolved into the most loving, productive human that you can be that's connected to all these other humans because we're in this family thing called the human family. There's only one race, the human race, and we want you to be a part of it and to be full and productive and beautiful and unique. You're your own unicorn, baby. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every child knew that they were their own unicorn in a family of wonderful unicorns. And again, that's pie in the sky. For people who are over 18 to 35, my wish uh, for them, Obehi, would be to be critical about the capitalist impulse in your life. How far 
you will allow the need for more and more and more to push you in your career, to push you with regards to choosing friends, choosing family. If there is this insatiable need for more, whatever that is, I would wish upon you to really rethink that. That there is something to be said about mindfulness. There's something to be said about balance. There's something to be said about harmony. There's something to be said about sacrifice. It is my turn, but I'm going to let you go. There's something to be said. It's very trite. Um, there was a poem that said, everything I needed to learn about life, I learned it in kindergarten. Wait my turn. Give somebody else another turn. Take a nap when I'm tired. Um, that's why I would wish for those babies in the 18 to 35 you range that if you're not careful and if you're so focused and so consumed about going for the more, that next promotion, that next degree, that next, that you could develop a habit of not being in balance with your own self, not being able really to tell yourself, you know what? I did that pretty well. I'm kind of satisfied. I think I'll take a break and give yourself permission to take a break to give yourself permission to recreate, to recreate, to give yourself permission to laugh when nothing's funny, to give yourself permission to have a friend and you have nothing in common with that person, except that you're both human and you're having a different experience. Um, in other words, to give yourself permission, obey him, to have life. Don't postpone it until you buy the car, until you, no. Give yourself permission to enjoy your beautiful life each and every day, one day at a time, and not allow capitalism to possess you and obsess you to the point you're so fixated and so driven that you can't remember the last time you laughed for no reason. You're powerful. I want to thank you for your for your presentation. Really, they are very beautiful. I don't know who told you that. Uh, you, you, you did make mention of a fear that somebody said you, you can talk. Really, you can talk very well. <clears throat> it really highly appreciating. Okay, thank you so much for that. Thank you for mm -hmm. having me. You're welcome. All right, now uh, within African American uh, experience or oh, history, let's call it. Uh, you did make mention of the fact of the nation without a nation. We were talking of the Web Du Bois and things like that. Uh, I want you to go back again and re, and re explain some of that part because it's highly valuable. A nation within a nation. With, in 2022, what would that mean? What would that mean to somebody? Some would hear nation within a nation and maybe be slightly offended or maybe greatly offended <laughs> because um, if anyone is an American, it's, it's you know, African-Americans, um, the people who were here when Africans first arrived and Europeans first arrived that we call American Indians, definitely American, if we put that label there, because their land was not called America. But if there were any other people that would call themselves American, that would be us. We were here from the very uh, beginning um, of the founding of the country. We were with explorers who came to this land. So we're extremely American uh, in that sense. Um, but there are those of us who have a lived experience where we are profiled and targeted in ways that other Americans are not. Um, and it happens so much that we can even say that it's systemic. So I'm going to slow it down just a little bit. So we are definitely American. As American, if as any other group. And in fact, the history of, and we're not counting American Indians. If we take American Indians out as the most indigenous, the next most American are people of African descent. You can take any uh, European here, any Caucasian here, and you could probably trace when there are peoples came to probably the 17th or 18th century, right? But People of African descent, our roots go all the way back to like the 14 and the 1500s. So we're the most American of all Americans, with only exception are American Indians. We're extremely American, right? But I'm suggesting that there are some experiences that we can have uh, that targets and profiles us in unique ways. And it happens so repeatedly 
that the profiling and the targeting is actually systemic. And I'm going to slow down to make sure people are hearing what I say. So here's just one example. Uh, African-Americans are stopped more for routine uh, issues uh, than other Americans. You were speeding. I thought your tags were out. Um, one of your taillights were out. Things that, yes, are infractions, but we're stopped for those small things much more than other people. So that's targeting and profiling. What makes it systemic? Because it's not just happening in Dallas, Texas, and it's not just happening in Memphis, Tennessee, and it's not just happening in Charlotte, North Carolina, and it's not just happening in Detroit, uh, Michigan. Doesn't happen so much in Omaha, Nebraska, though. Doesn't happen so much in Salt Lake City, Utah. Doesn't happen that much in Domingue, Iowa. So where there are huge concentrations of Black folk, and you see certain situations and habits happening to those Black people, we then make an argument that that racial profiling, that that racial targeting is systemic. It's not localized. It's happening around the country, wherever there's a critical mass of Black people. Those shootings that are occurring are not just happening in the South. They're happening all over the country in areas where there are significant numbers of African Americans. And the people who are in law enforcement, the people who are the police, if their cultural and linguistic backgrounds are not matching the people that they are policing, then you're actually doing a tinderbox. You're creating a situation for things to kind of pop off. What is the solution? It's kind of simple. You might want to hire people for law enforcement and police who match the people that they're supposed to be serving and protecting. Just a thought. Because when you don't do that, and the people who are pro supposedly providing the protection and the service, if they are separate from and away from the culture and linguistic, culture means how you live. Linguistic is not only how you speak, but even how you think. If their cognitive processes in their day-to-day -day life, the kind of music they listen to, the church they go to, the recreation they do, the jokes that they found funny, if everything is markedly different from the people that are supposed to be protecting and serving, they're not protecting and servicing those people. They are policing those people. That's the problem. Black people get policed and other groups of people get protected and served. We All should right. be protected and served. But in order to protect and serve, there has to be some overlap, some commonality between the people. Otherwise, you get a situation of a foreigner or an other policing the bodies of these subjugated people, these subjects, these others. And if you want to eradicate that, then make sure that there is some harmony between the people who are doing the protecting and the serving and the people who are being protected and served. And all the time, you don't have to have a one-to-one -one match in terms of racial demographic, but there should be some cultural and linguistic things in, in common. We get people running through training sessions, and I'm going to be facetious here, learn what it means to be Black in three easy steps. Take our course, and you'll never shoot a Black in the back. Okay, see, that's the problem. You're not going to identify with people by taking a three-week course. You would identify with people if you ate at people's house. You would identify with people if you worship at the church. You would identify the people if you went to some of these games. And, and so what I'm talking about, Obey, okay, is radical. Before you, you can serve here in this district, you must be caught a part of the lives of these people, serve on some of the nonprofit boards, go to some of the soup kitchens, participate in the parades. When they see you, they should recognize you as friend. They should recognize you as someone who's coming to help, not as a threat. And you can still have a gun on your hip because you're a part of the community. So it's a way to do it, Obehi, but whether or not we'll take the time to actually do it the correct way, I don't know. And until we do it, then Black people will continually be policed and the other people get protected and served. That's othering. That's systemic racism. I would love to be protected and served instead of policed. All right. That is a very powerful statement. And I would like us to explore it a little bit more. 
You see, a couple of uh, days ago, I interviewed uh, a U.S. historian uh, who have also, the topic of the conversation was critical race theory. And it was a, a conversation that we had here for, it, it was really very interesting. You know? At the point I was saying, uh, because since most of African Americans who are dying in the hand of the police, I usually die in the hand of white police, that one automatically lead to the question, are there lack of black police to police those people? Because that is actually, I think, where we are dragging the argument to just now. Because since this is something that is happening again and again and again, I want to believe somebody is taking the, the pay, the time to say, okay, let's study the situation. Let's find out what is happening. So, as a historian, have you found some document that suggests that, that there should be a better way of policing in the United States? Because I did also make an example yesterday when I was interviewing another uh, historian uh, um, in the U.S. that when I watch a law and order, for example, I see these very intelligent U.S. police officers who are doing the job of policing. In most of the cases, they don't just go around and start shooting and bringing the dead body to the law court. They bring a living human being to the law court after they have managed to arrest him or her. But what we see on the street, in most of the cases, at least the one that they show on the news, is a policeman succeeding in killing somebody, and the person is a, is, a, is a criminal. But what is the evidence to show that the dead person is a criminal if he cannot talk? Because dead people don't talk. That is why I'm asking for your help. Is there any evidence to the proper policing of the people. There is a movement uh, and researchers um, have documented um, the need for what we call community policing, community policing. So the people who are, the people whose job it is to protect and serve are a part of the communities that they are protecting and serving. Now, I don't know how far this research has gone. For example, has it gone far enough to study the mortality through police shooting that occurs from police who are actually living in and around and near the communities they protect and serve, as opposed to police officers that are protecting and serving communities that they are not a part of? Uh, and so there is a movement, community policing, so that people can look at a very simple thing called relationships. What are the relationships between the police and the communities that they're supposed to be protecting and serving? There's something to be said about relationship. There's something to be said about the people who are being policed, seeing you as friend, seeing you as help, seeing you as assistance, seeing you with more respect than fear. Unfortunately, We've got respect and fear confused. So if people respect you, they don't need to fear you. And you don't need to exert your authority in the form of violence because you've got the respect. When they see you, they see law and order, if I may use a proverb. But like I said, Obehi, I don't know if people willing, if people are really willing to do the work that it takes to accomplish what I'm talking about, it's going to take work to build relationships. You can't train systemic racism out of people. You can't train um, bigotry out of somebody. They have to have a process. They have to change over time and they have to have motivation and incentives that will cause them to want to go through that process. And not all of them need to be punitive and negative. One of the most beautiful things that happen in life are having meaningful, deep, fulfilling relationships. I've heard of not one person who with their dying breath said, oh, I wish I had spent at least five more years on my job because then I could have gotten two more certificates. Oh, I wish I had 
paid off the house in a 15 year mortgage instead of the 30 because then I could nobody is sitting around talking about their regrets of their bad financial decisions. Oh, I wish I had been able to at least get my credit up to 750 as I take my last breath. Most folk, if they have any regrets and they're talking about things that they wish they had done differently, are talking about some form of a relationship, who they could have forgiven, who they could have loved, who they could have talked to again, who they could have seen. So if relationships are critical enough for people who are dying to be thinking about that, come on, why not those of us who are very much alive and very healthy why don't we start looking at everything in our lives in terms of the health of that relationship? It would do, it would do, you talking about change the world. If we were talking about how healthy are my relationships with our police, how healthy are our relationships with our grocers, how healthy are our relationships? That's the biggest threat to the prison industrial complex right there. I don't even have to go on and on about black men disproportionately being incarcerated. I just need to ask people, how healthy is our relationship when it comes to rehabilitating criminals? How healthy are those relationships while they're in there and what they're supposed to be learning and doing? How healthy is that? You see, before, uh, when you were explaining, um, I think I was tempted to ask you uh, whether the fear is actually being manipulated. Because uh, I believe the society is in control of certain situations somehow is by society. I mean, those who are the custodians of the society, every one of us are part of the system, but we are not at the drivers, we, of how the Wait. system actually functions. Because this is the reason we volunteer part of our power to somebody to represent us. Wait. Those people we call government. Wait. That power they actually have come from the people. That is why they are powerful. Because people gave them power. Otherwise, they are just like every other person. With me, we are all equal. You see, several thousands of years ago, before human beings could organize a society, we could really do what we like, really. If I'm stronger than you, I kill you. Then I take whatever I, I, that you have. Sure. But in a, a lawful society, where we have the powerful, we have dedicated, we have given part of our power to them to run over us, I don't think people really should do whatever they like all the time. Like, for example, okay, I just choose to kiss somebody because I like to do that. Have I asked the other person, do you like to be kid? In this sense, I think the information that comes to people is not really as a kind of neutral information. There are rules. There are laws. There are order. There is no, okay, there are some little bit of chaos sometimes. But the society is run by rules and regulation. By this, I am trying to ask, is it a body, is it a worry to somebody that the system is the way it is today? That we are money, I don't know, maybe 10 people that are killed in a mass shooting today. Tomorrow, another one is going to happen. While we are in the funeral, or those people that are dead, maybe 40 people or 20 people, who knows, how many? We are thinking, when is it going to happen again next time? Is this one not worrying people who are in charge? Because they are powerful. We have given them power to be in charge. That is the question. I don't debate or disagree with anything that you said. In the United States, we have a, a Republican system in which we use voting to put people in place that we believe are going to protect uh, the best interest of their constituents. And hopefully everyone has elected officials because not everyone's constituents are the same. Uh, and so I, I believe that our country has a really good model, a really good ideal. So I don't debate anything that you have said, but what's interesting about where we are right now, in my opinion, or baby, is that social media has created an alternative universe, uh, if you will, in which the person with the power is the person that's able to win people over to follow them and support them. We've even created a whole new lingo for these people, influencers, right? So they weren't elected. They may not even be rich. They may not even be cute, because that's cute currency, Obehi. So they may not be cute, 
they weren't elected. They don't have a bunch of money. But for whatever reason, whatever content they have is resonating with enough people that those people are following them. And I know for a fact that social media is influencing the so-called powerful who are vested with the, the confidence and the votes of the people because those people then go to social media. Presidents are tweeting, governors are tweeting. Uh, one uh, former president, his Facebook had to get shut down because it was so powerful. So the idea that there's just a small number of us who get to tell the rest of us how to live is um, archaic. That's not how it's going anymore. And that's why I'm looping back around to those young people, while it's important to tell them to find their voice, because they will put out a video and it'll go viral. They'll put out a post and they'll say, like it, tag it, da, da, da. And all of a sudden, 500,000 people know what's going on. We know what happened when those rebels attacked the Capitol. We had folks using their phone, putting some information out there. We know who was there because people were on social media. So social media is a very powerful alternate universe, a very powerful alternate source of influence, a very powerful alternate source of accountability. And yes, it can be used in a bad way as well, as all things can. And so I don't want us to get stuck on just who's sitting uh, in the legislature at the state level and at the federal level. Regular people like you, regular people like myself also have the responsibility to speak to our truths. This podcast is a wonderful platform in which you're saying to people, I am a thinker, I'm engaged, engage with me. Uh, I try to explain to people that CRT was not meant to fix public schools. CRT was not meant to fix uh, the police. CRT was a dialogue, a conversation that people like myself with advanced degrees that we would kind of like kick around to try to make sense out of what is the best paradigm, the best framework, the best lens to kind of understand complex processes like institutional racism. But when we want to fix it, and when you want to change it, you talk to everybody. You talk to everybody. You welcome all the platforms, the bloggers, the influencers, the, the musicians, the preachers. You welcome and talk to everyone. And you get an idea of what is the best multi-tiered, multi-intelligent way that we can address this reality and change it. Because there's not one answer with one group of people because it's a human deficiency that we need to address. And it's bothersome to me, and I would even say grievous, that we have people spending hours and hours and hours going to school board meetings and parents getting upset and CRT, oh my God, woke theory. And I'm like, uh, so you're on the sidelines with a tangent. The real issue is what's causing harm and threat to the health and the well-being of our communities, of our children. And if you don't believe that that thing is a threat or causing ill being to you, can you see it as causing a threat over here? And as a part of the human family, do you care about that at all? Instead of being derailed by sidebar conversations that really are not solution oriented. I've read critical race theory. I've even used it in papers that I've written, but I wouldn't try to take it and present it as an answer to failing schools or an answer to gun control. Not in the least. That doesn't make any sense. And you need people to get that. When people start uh, breaking down into factions and, and having arguments and we can't get to the solution, then we need to stop talking because we're not actually getting anywhere and try to recalibrate so that we can see what actually would bring better health and better relationships so that our human family can function. I like the fact that you touch on, um, <clears throat> on critical race theory, and I can sense that you have a strong opinion on that. What is your take on it, on critical race theory? I'm disappointed because the creators did not intend for it uh, to be torn apart and um, 
demonized uh, as a threat to public education, as a threat to um, childhood or, or whatever else people people are, are saying. Um, those who, who, who deny that there's something called white supremacy, we can't help them. Critical race theory is not going to help them. Christianity is not going to help them. Nothing is going to help them because they are in a state where nothing can reach them. And we have to accept that. They don't believe that something called white supremacy exists. They don't believe that something called institutional racism exists. Uh, they don't believe that something called racial profiling exists. They don't believe. And they are just going to have to get our unconditional love and we're going to have to figure out how to coexist. Point blank, period. Let's stop arguing. Let's stop throwing stats. Let's stop, uh, um, you know, using incendiary language. Let's just stop. We're going to love you and accept you. You're loved unconditionally. You're accepted. And we're going to end it there. And I think they're in the minority. I actually think they're in the minority. For the rest, of white America who knows that we have some problems that we inherited, we didn't cause, but we refuse to take them any further. We refuse to take them any further. We do need to figure out of a way forward. And I guarantee you it's gonna involve the millennials, it's gonna involve social media, and it's going to involve um, people who are sexual and gender minorities, and it's going to involve faith communities. Believe it or not, we're going to have to bring faith to the table along with unconditional, unequivocal acceptance of all people in the human family to the table. There'll be Muslims at the table, Hindi at the table, Buddhists at the table, Christians at the table, people who are gay, straight, bisexual, transgender, asexual. We're all at this human table and we're forging a path forward. And we're going to leave a seat open for the people who are still in denial. Nobody's going to get their seat and we're not going to punish them. And if they ever decide to stop being in denial, about what's happening to the human family that we call the United States of America, they'll join us at the table. And if they don't, that's okay too. Their place will always be there. But you guys, we've got to move forward. We've got to stop arguing and move forward. Not in some Pollyanna, we're all equal, socialist world where everybody has a car and everybody has a five bedroom house and everybody. No, you guys, there's always going to be poor people. There's always going to be rich people. But in our country, we have to make some decisions like, but there'll be no one who needs somewhere to live and stay. Everybody's going to have somewhere to live. Everybody's going to have an address. And if they don't have an address, it's going to be because they say, I don't want an address. And we're going to say, OK, you don't have to have an address, but we have some rules, just like the people with addresses have rules. We have rules for people with no address. You can't defecate and urinate in public. You can't let your dog. You know, We all have rules. Right, Obehi, so that we can live harmoniously together. But we've got to come up with some deal breakers. And homelessness is a deal breaker. Hunger is a deal breaker. We can't have that. And those of us who want to come to the table and talk about that and not quibble over marginalized, erroneous things like what theory? No, we want to actually solve problems. We are already working on that. And we're moving forward. That's interesting. We're progressing, and that is good. That is encouraging, you know? I All right, Look, <laughs> looking at institutional racism, uh, because you made mention of it a couple of times in, your, uh, in your, your statement here, let's consider it as a problem, because already it is a problem. Let's use your word. All of us are called to this table to find a solution to the problem. Now, what do you think is going to be a, a solution to institutional racism in the United States. Of course, not only in the United States, in other parts of the West, we all suffer it. But in this case, we are talking on the United States. So what do you see as a solution? I'm not going to see it more than likely because I'm not going to live to be 100 or 200 or 300 or whatever. Um, but obey what it's going to take. And we're, we're one of the leaders of the West. We're a thought leader. Uh, in the West. We're a leader in industry, a leader in finance. We're a leader in almost every area. And I'm very 
I'm very proud if you can't tell the fact that I'm an American. I'm very proud of the fact that I'm a Texan and I'm proud of the fact that I'm a black Texan and a black American, but I don't know if I'll ever see it because it's so drastic of what it's gonna take. It's gonna take going back to the constitution and a complete overhaul not another amendment, amendment number. I think we're on 29 now. I'm not quite sure. No more band-aids, no more amendments. Go back to the beginning and say, we've got to do our charter all over again. Because when we met in Philadelphia to hammer out the constitution and the issue of slavery was um, uh, a hang up, they came up with a workaround that people who were enslaved would count as three-fifths of a human. And that would allow us to work around that issue. And compromise became the hallmark of my country, that, that we can figure out a supposed win-win in anything. And so we're going to have to go back to the beginning and say, there is no win-win in which anyone's humanity is trampled on. There is no win-win if sexual and gender minorities are told, you don't have the right to love, marry, raise a family, you're odd, you're an abomination, you are marginalized. There is no win-win. And it's, it's like I said, it's so radical. I probably won't see it in my lifetime, but we have to get there. There is no win-win. There is no compromise in which anybody's humanity is trampled upon. I went to a women's college. I am pro-choice. And it is concerning that Roe versus Wade was overturned. But the reason I can accept it is because what I see is an earnest attempt to say a woman's life is important, the life growing inside of a woman is important, and the issue is so pivotal but so big that perhaps it would be best to be handled by each and every state. That logic makes sense to me. That logic says there's a win-win in here and we're struggling to find it. That's what it's going to take, Obey, for us to have our beautiful hallmark of compromise and win-win, but have a deal breaker of it cannot trample on anyone else's humanity. And if it's trampling on someone's humanity, it's not going to work for us as the United States of America. We don't play that game. We don't trade humanity over here. Everyone's humanity is precious, is sacred, and we do our best as a nation to assert that in every law, in every policy and in our day to day. I don't know how it will work out having the states decide how they feel about when life can be terminated or if it can be terminated, but I applaud the Supreme Court's desire to have a win-win that shows respect for life and try to uh, put those decisions as close to the individual as possible. I'm proud of my country in spite of our struggles and in part of our pain, I am. And I want more for my nation and the more perfect union that I dream of, Obehi, I'll never see, but I'm okay with that because I inherited America that the slaves never saw. There's a poem by Maya Angelou and she says, I am the dream, I'm the hope of the slave, I rise, I rise. And she's gone on, Dr. Maya Angelou, but those of us who understand what she stood for, we hold those principles in our hearts. We still rise, we do, because we're standing on the shoulders of those people who never saw their prayers answered. So I would be less than they are if I stop praying or I stop believing because I'll never inherit the blessings that I'm believing and praying for. So I'm going to stay on the wall. That's what Christians say when we're praying for something. Are you on the wall? Are you on your knees? So I'm going to stay on my knees, fight on my knees, fight on the wall, and continue to, to 
try to build the America that I think it can be, even if I never get to see it myself. Dr. Martin Luther King said, well, I'm going to the mountain. And, and I may I, not I, get I, you with you, but we <laughs> the people, we're going to the promised land. He didn't make it. He was murdered in 68. He didn't get to that promised land, but we're going. And, and we as a people is the human family, not just black people. We'll get I believe there. you. I believe we'll you. And also the United States is a very important country uh, for the liberty that the, for, for, the, for the courage you have to, to be what it is. Of course, there are some defect in every human being, in every situation, in every society. Uh, we hope that it can become a perfect union. That is what we really hope because yes. it's actually one of the best countries in the world. Mm -hmm. All right, now, okay. Uh, two days ago, three days ago, the United States celebrated its independence, the 4th of July, since uh, 1776. Mm -hmm. Because we are talking of hope, we are talking of solution to the problem. Have you seen something that we can hook up to as a time that it was actually moving away from this deliberate attempt to prey on certain individuals in the society, in this case, the African-American? I'm still talking of, um, uh, of systemic racism. Something that we can look up and say, okay, at that time, it was almost there that we can go back to our droid table. Because sincerely, my sister, I don't know if it's going to happen that one day that constitution is going to be reviewed and really rewritten so that it can favor everybody. I don't know if it's, it's a possibility. But because we don't know what we don't know of the future, at least we know what we know of the past. This is history. Bring me back to that point where we can hook up to. Okay. When is, yeah. This is going to shock you, but uh, I'm a Republican. I'm a Black Republican. I'm the only one, I believe, in my entire district. Um, and I switched parties in March of 2020, right after COVID hit. I just made a decision in terms of where my political alliance is going to lie, and, and that's what I did. And there's a lot that I know about people who are Republicans that a lot of people in my community don't know. And there are heroes that I have that people in my community would kind of frown upon. Uh, I didn't vote for the former uh, president, Donald Trump, even though my friends were like, oh, we need every vote in the trees. We need every vote. I'm like, well, actually, no, I'm not going to be able to do that um, because of some decisions that he's made and some behaviors and some posturings that show me that he's not pro-human being like I am. You got to be pro-human being. And so I wasn't able to make uh, that choice. But there are some... Republicans that I really admire. And I'm going to get to your question of, is there a point in history where we can look back to and be encouraged since there probably is a pie in the sky element of me saying that the whole constitution needs to be revoked and rewritten. I admire Abraham Lincoln. He was a Republican. I admire Martin Luther King. He was a Republican. And I admire, and these are all men, I admire um, Ronald Reagan, who was also a Republican. And I'm going to tell you why I admire those men and how I think we can pull something from the past uh, to help us move forward, because more than likely my pipe dream will never happen, that the Constitution uh, will be revoked and rewritten. So Abraham Lincoln said that if I could preserve the Union by freeing every enslaved person, I would. And he said, and if I could save the Union by not freeing a single enslaved person, then I would. And even though he went down in history as the great emancipator, that's actually a misnomer, misname. He's not the great emancipator. The Emancipation Proclamation, which was going to effect January 1st, 1863, said that if you were an enslaved person within a territory state that has seceded, that was in rebellion against the Union, you would be free. If you were enslaved in a state that had not left, you would not be free. So the people who were in states that had seceded, the slave states that had seceded, not the slave states that stayed, the slave states that had seceded, he freed the slaves there. What well, he had no authority over there was enslaved people because they were now part of the Confederate States of America, the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis was their president. So President, you know, 
Biden can't write laws for Mexico, for Switzerland. He's not the sovereign there. Similarly, President Lincoln couldn't write a law and enforce it in the Confederacy because they had their own government. So the enslaved people that he could have freed, people who were enslaved in slave states that had never ceded, they were still a part of the United States, he didn't free them. We gave him the title of great emancipator. That's not his title, but a fitting title. And why I uh, admire him and where we can look for inspiration, obey he, is because that man had conviction. His conviction was that the union deserved to be um, preserved, to be reunified. And he was so committed to that that he said, whatever I have to do to make that a reality, free everyone that's enslaved, keep everybody that's enslaved. And am I saying it was a great idea to keep black people enslaved? God forbid, no. But what I'm saying is I'm asking your question, where can we look for inspiration? That's a great person to look for inspiration to, to have conviction. However, we should have a conviction that every person's human rights are sacred and valid and must be protected, but have conviction. Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King was also a Republican. Martin Luther King was wonderful at collaboration. He could work across race, he could work across gender, he could work across socioeconomic, he could work across faith. That movement was a grassroots movement that actually had black women at its core, Mississippi, excuse me, the Montgomery Improvement Association, the MIA, uh, was the group that actually um, came up with a brainchild of Montgomery Boys Boycott, which then triggered a whole series of, of, of organized uh, protests. Those were Black women, and he worked extremely well with Black women, Black church women, uh, to be even more particular. And then he worked well with Jewish people, and then he worked well with wealth. He was just, a, he was, he was just very astute. Uh, and he worked extremely well across lines. Uh, and if I may throw another black man in there, Booker T. Washington was astute like that as well. So I would take that capacity uh, to collaborate as another lesson for history. So we have conviction, we have collaboration, and then we come to my boy, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was a financial mastermind, a financial mastermind. His flaw was that he lacked the conviction and the collaboration of his Republican predecessors. The growth of our country financially in the 80s was astounding, but it was an isolated wealth. And he said that ultimately it would trickle down. We never got no drops down here in the hood. And so conviction, collaboration, and being a financial wizard is a way forward for us. We need to collaborate. We need to have conviction. We need to watch those pennies and dollars. But at the core, obey him. It won't work if we don't agree that everybody's humanity is sacred. Everybody's humanity is equal. Everyone. And if we can't agree on that, there's nothing we're going to learn from history, obey him. Nothing. Thank you so much for that. Now, what would be your final statement to conclude the conversation? I thank you so much. I've never done a podcast and I was a little nervous because I wasn't sure what it is, it is it or anything. And I was like, what do you do? And I've enjoyed um, the dialogue and I just hope and pray that it finds itself in hands of, of young people, of parents, of preachers and pastors and leaders and thinkers who make that commitment. Um, that we're here on this planet and that we are one family and that the human family uh, deserves uh, this best life that we can. And this one earth that we have, it's just like this one body that we have, that we make a commitment to one another to care for each other and to care uh, for our planet in a much better way moving forward. Even if we can't reap all the benefits in our own lifetime, let's do it for our children and our children's children. Lead this planet in a better shape and leave uh, relationships in a better shape than what we found you. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It has been an honor talking to you. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure you subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes. Rate and review Overhead Podcast and share with your friends who might need it. 
I remain over here at one Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you in the next episode.